First of all, I'd like to say thank you for inviting me to share my thoughts and my ideas here today for Tushita and everybody here. So before we begin, I think it's good to build up a good motivation and in any sort of situation, especially in Dharma and uh, Buddhist studies, it's really good to have a good motivation before we begin any sort of occasion or any sort of discussion or gathering. So I'll be doing a short prayer, and while I'm doing a short prayer, I'd like all of you to, uh, to have a good motivation, and I will guide you through it. So for example, like, may all sentient beings who are suffering be free from suffering, to those who will desire happiness be able to achieve happiness, those who are suffering may their sufferings end quickly, and those who are, ha who are having happiness may their happiness be indefinitely onwards. So I'll be doing a short prayer, and I would like you to think about that. Sangye cha dan cho ki cha nam la, chan jo pa tu ta ni kya sum che, da ki jin su ki be so nam ki, do la bin che sangye du bara hai jo, sangye cha dan cho ki cha nam la, chan jo pa tu ta ni kya sum che, da ki jin su ki be so nam ki, do la bin che sangye du bara hai jo, sangye cha dan cho ki cha nam la, chan jo pa tu ta ni kya sum che, da ki jin su ki be so nam ki, do la bin che sangye du bara hai jo. And also to, I would also like to say, let's to dedicate all this, all the merit that we have accumulated today, for the swift return of Lama Sabarim for the so that he can fulfill his virtuous legacy, and also to benefit the numbless, numbless sentient beings who are suffering, and to all the students of Lama Sabarim to be to have a t the teacher back to guide them through their dharmic studies and to let, guide them to enlightenment. So uh, I would like to dedicate that, the merit that we have gained today for that. So I was told today to talk on education and uh, I was thinking, you know, of course education is important in general, whether it is worldly education or spiritual inner education. And in general, when we talk about education, there's always a goal to an education. Like you go to a university, for example, someone will go to university to get a good job, to get a good job in order to be, have a successful life. So that is like the goal for a worldly study. But with just that, it kind of lacks the inner education, the inner peace. We just through the worldly educations, uh, there's not much emphasis in the inner peace part of it, which has to rely on the inner virtuous and uh, spiritual education. And same with uh, the worldly education, the spiritual education also has its own goals. The goal is to attain, to be, Bud to be enlightened, to attain Buddhahood, and to be free from samsara. Mm -hmm. So, but in order to do that, of course, you might, someone would ask, you know, like, how do you be free from samsara? Um, how does one become free from samsara? Because it's not really that easy. It's not really clear. It's just how do you be free from samsara? And in order to do that, you need the, in, you need the inner education to dispel the ignorance. And that is the root of samsara. Since we are all in samsara, the uh, thing that binds us to samsara, things that made us go return to samsara again and again with this rebirth is the ignorance. And how do you get rid of ignorance? That is through education. And what type of education is the inner education? And you can also ask, what is inner education then? Does that mean like going to a spa and relaxing? Like, you know, taking a day off and just calming the mind down? I mean, it could work for one or two days, you know. There's some benefits to that, sure. But mainly, of course, when you say inner ed uh, education or spiritual education, it has to rely on the wisdom and method in, in Buddhism. Uh, Mainly we talk about the wisdom and method aspects that help us with the inner education. So when we say like, for example, um, the wisdom part of it, we are talking about the, you know, the, the understanding emptiness, the mind realizing emptiness. And when we say uh, method, we're talking, of, uh, we're talking about bodhicitta, compassion, kindness, patience and all that. And those things have to come together, of course, in order to attain Buddhahood, in order to be the most optimal way to help all sentient beings is to use the tools of wisdom methods together. And when we say, and especially nowadays, when we talk about the 
um, what you call that, the method of compassion, kindness, and in general, just meditating on kindness or compassion, and also practicing kindness and compassion, it is very relatable nowadays as well, since, you know, nowadays we have, we, will, we all like to say that we want to accept all sentient beings as equal, that all we want to diminish discrimination, uh, discrimination as much as possible, to view all sentient beings as equal and to wish for the best for them. And this kind of idea is not a new idea. It has been there since Buddha's time, especially in Buddhism. When Buddha, were, during Buddha's time, there was a huge emphasis in the caste system, which of course is discriminates people depending on their birth. And which Buddha said, it doesn't really matter whether you are a, you know, a low caste, high caste, male, female, what, in whatever person you may be. Ultimately, through purification, through practice, through self through self practice and self study, one can become Buddha. No matter who you are, where you are from, what gender, what world, whatever, all, all of this depends on you. you know? all of anybody can be Buddha. It just depends on whether you choose to do the things that make you attain Buddhahood. So ultimately, you are your own enemy as well as your own teacher. You are both sides to it, and. This kind of idea can, I think in general, like it's very relatable for nowadays people because we want to accept everyone and Buddha already has said that. And also it makes us kind of uh, look past looks. You know? Since everybody has the Buddha nature, everybody has their mind being clear at first. It's just being clouded out by our afflictions and our negative emotions. If you look like, at, like in that way, it doesn't matter who you're looking at. Everybody's the same in that way. And that kind of, if you put in that kind of sense, it makes us easier to kind of relate to people, saying that, oh, that person wants to, to be free from suffering, that person wants, also wants to attain uh, happiness, and they can also attain happiness, I can also attain happiness, they can also be Buddha, I can also be Buddha. It just now depends, it's everything is in our own hands now, and we have to, through wisdom and method, through the practices, be able to attain Buddhahood. And uh, with that, of course, you know, uh, when we, with that, of course, in order to do the method part of it, you also need the wisdom. Since, for example, if someone tells you to meditate on compassion, if you don't really know what compassion is, how do you meditate on it? Someone, it if you don't know what you're meditating on, you, and you're just doing this, and you're better off sleeping, you know? You're just making yourself tired, back pain. So if you know what you're meditating on, like, if you know, like, you know, compassion is the mind that wishes sentient beings to, the suffering sentient beings to be free from suffering. If you have this general idea of what compassion is, then you can think about how do you achieve this compassion? What are the examples of compassion? How, what are the benefits of compassion? You know? So in order to do that, you need to have the, the, the wisdom of under knowing what these uh, topics are. And from that, I think, uh, since I've been studying in Sarah J, the Geshe program from seven years, uh, it has been helping me a lot with that, since we've been studying through the text, ancient Indian texts, and on the definitions, and on the ideas of compassion, emptiness, and all that. And with knowing what you're med meditating, knowing what you're studying, and using the method of debate. Since in Sarah, uh, when we talk about philosophy, we, we talk of philosophy through the medium of debating. And of course, I don't expect everybody to just you know, learn debating that way, but get it, using the idea of debate, the tools of debate, which is the analytical part of it. So like, for example, when you hear, listen to, you might say like, for example, it's, uh, I can't learn the whole text, I can't read through all this, I don't have time for it. Of course, I don't expect everybody to have as much free time as me since I'm a monk, I know I wake up, prayers, can study again, you know, have lunch, can study again, don't have to work. And a lot of people here have to, have to go work, have to take care of the family, their social life, so I don't expect you to, you know, do the monk's life. But using the idea of debate, of the analytical side of it, so whenever you're reading a book, a text, for example, or whenever you're hearing or listening to a teaching, kind of not just listen to it and, uh, and take it for what it is directly, kind of think of why is the teacher saying it this way? For what 
contextualize it and try to relate it to something that you can apply to day-to-day -to -day life. And with that, it makes it easier for you to relate to it and kind of have faith in it more. Since faith through reasoning is stronger than I think blind faith. So if you kind of have, can find a reasoning for why the guru has said something or why the guru had said it in a particular way, then if you can contextualize it and apply it to your own day to day life, it sticks with you longer and it can really benefit you in the long run. So of course, as I said, so for me, of course, I've been debating and I've been going through the text and all that, and it does really help since there are many topics that can be a lot of misconceptions, can be a lot of different sort of ideas that you may have preconceptions pre, uh, that you may have on a subject before you studied it. And once you studied it a, a bit more, analyze, it becomes much clearer. And also with this debate format, I also think it can also broaden the mind up a lot. Because even though a lot of people like to say no, or we, we want to treat all sentient beings the same, we want to appreciate all different views, but once someone says something that you don't like, you're like, nah, I don't want to listen to him. He's talking nonsense, you know? There's this kind of contradiction with people nowadays where they like to say we accept all people, we have to accept everything, but then the moment someone says something that is not exactly the thing you like or is different from your opinion, instantly they're like, nah, I don't want to talk with him. There's not much discourse there in a the sense of sharing ideas. So if you've been doing like debates where you're sharing different ideas, you're debating on the idea, you're discussing on topics, it makes your mind broaden up to new ideas. And it makes it so that not just in the context of practice and study, but in general day-to-day -day life, it can make your mind more broad and more accepting. I think that can be also quite beneficial, the idea of analyzing and debating. And with also, like, uh, as I said on, also not just the wisdom as well, you know, we also have to apply the method. Because whatever you're doing with the wisdom part of it, ultimately you're doing it so that you can apply in your day-to-day -day life. So not just, because if you don't do that, the studying bit of it or the, how to say it, the analytical bit, bit of it just becomes like a really normal study, you know? You're not ultimately using it and using its full potential. You're just treating it as something that you just learned and just using it like that. Whatever you have learned, it should have been applied to your, whatever tiny bit that you may have learned, doesn't have to be a lot as well. Whatever tiny bit that you saw and resonated with should be applied in your day-to-day uh, -day practice as well. So I, I would like to say that the philosophical side and your practice should not be separate. It can be together, it can be put together, and it can be applied at the same time as well. And on that topic as well, um, if you don't, yeah, on that topic as well, um, uh, this one thing that I, I hear from now, every now and then, uh, I see people asking me this question, and I also kind of feel this kind of energy from people as well, where nowadays since there's a lot of, everything's very fast paced, the hustle and bustle, you know, you have to go from A to B, B to C instantly, you know, or you order something on Amazon, it comes, today instantly, you know? Everything needs to be fast, it needs to be, you know, it has to come immediately. And that kind of mentality applied to, you know, your practice it also can be very detrimental, can be kind of like a destructive way. Because what happens is, we, when you practice something, when you are doing your pra daily practices, whatever it may be, it is to habituate a positive mentality, a positive, uh, action, a positive kind of reaction to things, a positive kind of mindset. And you can't habituate something in one day or like a week. You have to do it gradually and always. Especially when, in, especially when you talk about lam rim, for example. Lam rim literally means gradual path. You know, that's the, the gradual path. The things that you practice should be done slowly and to, you have to do it wholeheartedly with a pure intention and keep doing it again and again and then the results may start to appear. And if it doesn't appear as well, it's okay because everybody has their own pace and not everybody has the same sort of ability as everyone. And what I hear sometimes people are like, oh, I, I want to do something but the results haven't happened yet and I kind of feel like it's not working, for example. And the guy next to me, he's been doing it for a week and he's already like 
seems so peaceful. Well, what's with that? You know? And I say, like, you're doing these practices so that you can improve your mindset, your own mindset. And the fact that they are doing whatever doesn't really matter, for the fact, because they, they, they are not the ones who are purifying your negative emotions or your negative sort of mindset. It's up to you, as I said. Whatever problems that you have there can be purified if you put effort into it and if you take your time with it. And I think having this more kind of mindset can also be very kind of beneficial to young people as well, since in this world, in nowadays as well, there's a lot of mental uh, suffering. You know, people have depression, anxiety, lack of confidence. There's all sort of problems that can happen. But if you, through, and also people may think, oh, I, they feel hopeless. They feel kind of helpless in this world. Like, nothing can help me. Like, the, the world is against me. You know, this kind of, kind of thoughts will happen to people. But if you think that, you know, this, me being, suff me suffering is in my hand. You know, me suffering and this suffering can be elevated by, my, by myself. I can do this. I can have things affecting me outside, but ultimately it depends on me. And it kind of brings like a self-assurance that things may happen outside that may really affect you mentally, but ultimately if you keep strong and if you persevere, you can achieve, you can get past it. And ultimately, as I said, attain Buddhahood, attain a sort of peace that, you know, that you don't have to suffer anymore. It is possible, and as I said. And this kind of thought, I think, with young people as well, can bring a sort of confidence that is very needed nowadays. Because most people, or like, and especially in the West, I think, is when people take medicaid, if they get depressed or something, they take the short, as I said, again, the fast thing. I want, uh, since I'm feeling depressed, rather than going to the root of the cause, you know, something that has affected you mentally, they go instantly to oh, a medication. Then they start taking more medication and more medication and more medications, and it sort of builds up again and again. It's like just putting a Band-Aid on a wound and not putting medication on it, and just, it just festers. It just gets worse and worse and worse. But through inner education, through you know, spiritual education, through studying the Dharma, and it also doesn't have to be Dharma as well. I mean, to those uh, just being a good person, learning the morality through just the practice of morality. And for us Buddhists, of course, through the teachings of Dharma, of teaching of what Buddha has said in the past and what your masters have told and all that, it can really help at the root of the problem. And once you take care of the root, then it becomes very easy to kind of branch out and kind of take care of whatever the smaller problems are. But if you don't do that from the root, what happens is you may feel better for one day, but then it comes back again. It comes back again and again and again. And ultimately, it won't really help if you just don't really look at what is actually the problem. So I think like this kind of idea of you know, self-confidence, of, of you know, knowing that everything is in your hand, you can become Buddha as well. Anybody can be Buddha regardless of your ability. That idea can really be beneficial to a lot of people, you know? And if, even in a Buddhist, we don't have to go to the Buddha side of it. You can say, you know, uh, what problems that you may have, you know, you can take care of it if you put your heart into it. And you, the, the cause of your sufferings, of course, they are external matters, but if you can take care of it internally, and through your mental perseverance, it can alleviate a lot of the problems. And people just don't really think, into, think to that part because of the, how the fast paced the world is at this current moment. So, I have not much to say, but I hope that what I've said today was uh, helpful in even a tiny way. As I'm sure that a lot of you have even more experience than me. You have more life experience than me. You have more, some of you could have also more practices than me. But I hope that what I've said was, you know, helpful. And thank you so much for letting me come and speak here. And again, as I, again, before we end, I would also like to say, again, yeah, dedicate this whatever merit that we have caused today for the... Lama Sopra Mishra's reincarnation to come, for Amhib to come, to come and teach us all, to guide us as well, and for the health of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, may he live for a long life, may he be able to teach and help as many sentient beings as possible. And for us here as well, those who are here, be able to practice their, their practices without any obstacles, to be able to, you know, 
go with, through life and be able to reach, the, uh, to be able to share the Dharma with as many people as possible, and in the next life as well, be able to be born in a situation where they can, they can, you know, experience the Dharma and experience the benefits of it. Because there's so many people in this world. There's like, I guess, 30, 40 people here. Like, you know, there's so the numbers, no? So like this, I hope, I hope that this can continue and may all your practices be able to flourish. And yeah, so I will do a dedication prayer and uh, I guess dedicate the, the merits you have to your own personal, uh, of course your own personal dedication as well, but also the dedication that I've said as well. Oh, yeah. So offer a short mandala on page 243. And then prayer book, page 243. <laughs> Swift return of Lama Zubrimbashe, as um, Rimbashe pointed out, on the single A4 sheet. Peerless teacher and assembly of the children of the victorious swans, Shravakas, and Pratyaka Buddhas, victorious Lozong, father and sons, along with the lineage masters, all the objects of refuge of infinite lands, please bestow the virtue and goodness of accomplishing this prayer here and now. Holding and spreading the Muni's precious and complete teaching through explanation and practice, you wore the armor of patience that is never discouraged. Incomparable, venerable guru, to you I make request. While striving single-pointedly for the sake of the victorious one's teachings, the sole gateway through which all benefit and happiness emerge, and from other living beings, you suddenly departed to peace. What a great loss. Nevertheless, to the unreceiving truth, of the blessings of the ocean of the three jewels and the great waves of bodhicitta of the children of the victorious ones. May the smile of a reincarnation swiftly beam in glory for fortunate disciples. Since today I became Gelong, a senior monk ordination, this is my first thing. I'm very fortunate to be able to share a talk with you all as my first act as a Gelong. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Congratulations, Rinpoche, oh. for your ordination. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. You rejoice so much. Thank you so much.